So a little bit about our featured speaker today. Dr. Catriona Shea is an alumni professor in the biological sciences and professor of ecology in Penn State's Department of Biology. And in her work, Dr. Shea uses and develops ecological theory to understand and manage invasive and outbreaking species. She's an elected fellow of the Ecological Society of America and of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And so today, Dr. Shea will present a lecture entitled Infectious Disease Outbreak Control, Harnessing the Power of Multiple Models to Work Smarter, Not Harder. And so Dr. Shea, thank you so much for being here today. If you give her a round of applause and we will turn it over to her. Can everyone hear me at the back okay? Good. All right, so I'm Katrina Shea, and as uh, Dr. Kim Schmidt just said, I'm a professor here in the Department of Biology, and I'm also in the Center for Infectious Disease Dynamics. Um, I always like to know a little bit about the people who are speaking in uh, sessions like this. I thought I'd give you a little background. As you can probably tell by now, I'm actually originally British, um, just in case you didn't notice. Um, I did all of my education in the UK, so, and I actually did an undergraduate degree in physics in Oxford University, and then I'd had biology as a hobby the whole time, and I saw the light and jumped ship to biology, but I still like physics, but I love the ecology that I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, I've studied a variety of systems over my career. Um, I initially started looking at invasive plants, so outbreaking plant species. How do they move around the world? Why do they do what they do? What can we do to control them? And that got me thinking also about disturbed systems. What is it about a hurricane or a fire or a flood that's just like adding antibiotics for a disease? They're all disturbing a system in some way. Is there something that's general across all of these topics? So I can safely say those first two I have been working on since the last century. Okay, <laughs> so it's a good time. And then more recently, I started looking at the more complicated communities in which these species are embedded, and I collaborate with a colleague in physics, Dr. Raker Albert, to look at plant insect networks. And then more recently, probably about eight, ten years ago, I started looking at disease outbreaks, because clearly an outbreak of a disease like the current coronavirus that we're seeing in China isn't at first glance, like a plant or an insect outbreak. But if you're a theoretician, what you're looking for is what are the general rules that govern all of those outbreaks that allow us to not start from scratch every time there's a new problem? Because if you have to start from complete ground zero every time there's a new problem, it's going to take you a really long time. Is there a way to use ideas from other systems, which is what a theoretician does, to understand and jumpstart a new process? Um, so, is there a way to work smarter, not harder, hence the title of today's talk, where we can draw on ideas from one field and move them into others, okay? So, I'm a theoretician, and I'm really interested in the theoretical links between these and many, many other different systems. And as I'm saying, um, the whole point about this is to avoid reinventing the wheel when you start with a new problem. So, that gives you a bit of a background. Um, in the past, in the 1700s and 1800s, it was possible to be a true polymath. You could be really good at biology and chemistry and physics and astronomy and be you know, in the Royal Society and contribute meaningfully to the groundbreaking forefront of all of these research areas. These days, there's just so much existing knowledge already, it's not possible to do that, though they still exist. Polymaths, and in fact, a lot of science is done in teams. And these are the people with whom I collaborate. There are undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs, and faculty at Penn State and elsewhere who have contributed to the work I'm going to talk about today. They've also contributed some of the videos I'll show you and some of the images I'll show you today. So, ooh, is that better? Great, excellent. I also want to thank very much our funding sources, the US Department of Agriculture and the National Institutes of Health, and sometimes the NSF funds different parts of my work, um, without which clearly these exercises would not be possible. So thank you to all of these contributors. So I told you what I think theory is. Theory is just having an idea about how the world works. But in fact, we all model all the time. So every single one of you actually does these mental calculations. For example, if you go to the supermarket and you see this, 
And you're standing, and there are two aisles that you can choose from. And one of them has a person, a very harassed looking person, with six kids and two full tr um, truck carts. And the other one has a single person holding just a basket. And then you see that the first person also has coupons and a checkbook. I am pretty sure you know which aisle you're going to go in. You're doing the mental calculation about how long it takes to get through the end of your shopping trip, right? And we're doing these sorts of mental calculations all the time. So we are, in fact, all modelers. But that said, I will confess, I was probably really near the end of my PhD before I really got what a model was. Like, really, really understood it. So I thought quite hard. This is kind of the definition I like. A model is a description or a summary of a system from which you can make some sort of prediction. And I actually find um, that there's sort of, you know, we use models for things like developing spaceships. You know, you'd never send a ship into space without testing it in a wind tunnel first, right? You want to test it out, have prototypes. It's never as big or as perfect as the uh, main one will be, but you're always using them. Um, so there's some sort of physical model, and I'm going to show you a model of an animal. All right, and I'm going to give you three choices. Is this a model giraffe? <laughs> Anyone put your hands up if you think this is a giraffe. <laughs> okay. Is, oh, someone had to do it. Doug works on giraffes. Our dean works on giraffes. So. Does anyone think this is a model whale? No, no. Who thinks this is a dog? Put your hands up. Oh, good job, everyone. Well done. Very good, very good. Now, what would make it more like a dog? You have no idea how hard it is to find a toy like this. Do it one more time. Thank you. It is wagging its tail. It is barking. So not only does it look like a dog, but it also behaves like a dog, all right? So this is a model dog that describes the system and also some behavior of the system. But let's also think about the purpose of this dog. Because when we write models, there's an aim that we're trying to ask a question or decide about some system. This dog is very, very good for the purpose of teaching a small child what a dog is compared to a giraffe or a whale. What it is not good for is the purpose for, of teaching a small child how much work it would be to look after a real dog, <laughs> right? Because it only barks when you want it to, it doesn't eat, it doesn't excrete, yeah. it doesn't require walking multiple times a day. So it is very good for one purpose, it's an excellent representation of reality for one purpose, and perhaps not so great uh, for a different purpose, the purpose of teaching a child about the effort. So I will leave that there. Um, now, that's a physical model. The sorts of models that we're talking about in this series are mathematical or statistical models. I'm going to focus on mathematical models. And I basically am talking about how you describe a system uh, that behaves in some way, uh, but using quantitative methods, so using um, mathematics. And I'm going to just give you an illustration um, so that we're all on the same page in a moment. Um, but there's lots of ways models are used. Um, we use models to look at human population growth and demographic uh, movements and things like that. We look at how uh, all the species that are listed are threatened and endangered and so forth. Those have precise meanings that are driven by models. They used to be uh, defined by experts, but now they're written down and you can actually quantify a lot of these things. We study invasive species and outbreaking species like diseases. Um, we do a lot of modelling of wildfire management. In Australia, for example, there have been these huge and devastating wildfires recently. A lot of these things are modelled. A lot of the west coast of the USA, is um, man fire management is done via modelling. Climate change is very heavily modelled. Okay, so let me give you an example of the first of these things. Human populations. This is a beautiful NASA composite photo of the world at night. Um, and have I got a mouse? <laughs> have I got a mouse? Um, a pointer. Let's see. Oh, I did not check that. That was not my finest moment. All right. Well, never mind. If you look up on this picture, you can see the Nile. Have we got a pointer, Joel? 
Ha, there we go. Here's the Nile. You can see all the lights on the Nile. You can see sort of, here's Japan, very brightly lit. I always love these. Look at these roads and railways across the former Soviet Union. You can see also in, in here, we have very high human density. And you can also see that it's distributed across the US as well. But you know there's a lot of people here too. So it's also reflecting our resources. Let's have a look in this section and think about the fact that this year we're going to have a census. Okay, the US census counts the number of individuals in the population in this country. Um, but we do that, and it's really important for resource and allocation purposes, um, but it actually um, isn't just what people do. So a lot of human demographers, and there's whole groups working on human demography, are working out how many people we expect there to be in different places and at different times through the future. So let's think about how that will work. Ten years ago, we counted the number, N, of people in the USA. Can you... Oh, dear. Let me do this so it's a bit clearer. Can you read that at the back? Is that big enough? It's the number of people in 2010. All right, that's how many people were counted in the last census. How did that number change over the last decade? Can anyone think of something that would have made that, pro that, that number bigger? Birth. Great. If you go down the road to the hospital, there's a maternity ward where births are going on. What makes it smaller at the other end of life? <laughs> Deaths, right? All right. What else? I wasn't here in the past, right? I started in Britain. What did I do? I immigrated. And what do some other people do? Thank you. And if you take the births over 10 years, the deaths over 10 years, the immigration and emigration over 10 years, you can take that original number and say, well, I can calculate the number of people I expect in the census that's kind of started but really starts at the end of March, beginning of April, right? So this, for those of you who haven't modeled before, is your first model. Because what you've just done is you've saved yourself from writing down, and listen to this sentence, the number of people in 2020 in the United States of America is equal to the number of people that were there in 2010, plus all the births that happened in 10 years, plus, plus, plus. Right? And you've just written a shorthand. So that's all that the model is. It's a summary, but we're speaking maths is basically the way to think about it. And it makes it so much easier to think about what's going on when you know that B means the births over 10 years. And if you know what these rates are, so the number of births per individual, you can take any of these numbers and say, well, what, else can I, what do we expect in 2030 or 2040 or 2050 or by the end of the century? And so you can project it through into the future, but without actually having to do the work of counting it in the future. So you can guess what's going to happen. You're never perfect, right? You're making assumptions that birth and death rates don't change, but you can actually look at what's going on in the future. So you've written down your first model, and you can make it go um, in, forward in time. So models can help us to understand all sorts of things, and this is a list I showed you before, and I've added disease dynamics to the bottom, because that's what we're going to be talking about in today's talk. Pathogens cause diseases and they harm the infected host. Um, the pathogen can potentially kill the host. Those are the ones we really, really worry about, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes there's not direct death, so you can get a mild case of cold or so forth and be fine. And there are viruses, some fungi, but not all fungi, just be careful about, and lots of bacteria. And so I've got some images up here, um, smallpox at the top, which luckily we don't have anymore because it was deeply unpleasant, as you can see from that image. There's an Ebola virus and flu virus on this image, too. Um, and we have always, always been worried about diseases. These are um, uh, the bills of mortality from uh, London, which were collected for a very long period of time. They were always call also called London's Dreadful Visitation, which is such a great title. And I love the bit at the top with the skull going, Memento Mori, which is Latin for remember you shall die. Um, you know, and so they're illustrated with skulls, and they were collated every week for, for a very long period of time. So this on the right-hand side is one of them, and it's from 1665 when a great plague had hit London. So take a second and read some of them, because they're hilarious, and not hilarious at the same time. 74 people died of griping in the guts. 
That's always an interesting one. Somebody was murdered at Stepney. But do look at 3,880 3, people died in one week of the plague, right? Terrifying, right? It was a terrifying thing. Um, so people have documented and cared about the impact of disease on populations for a very, very long time, right? So pathogens can be incredibly important, right? We're very worried at the moment about coronavirus. There's also flu outbreaks going on at the moment. There are other diseases all the time. Um, plague, smallpox, flu, malaria, measles, HIV have all had actually really very big impacts on human population, public health, um, through history. Um, so if we sort of combine the ideas where we looked at human growth models um, and then think about diseases, this is um, a sort of human population over quite a long time, up to more or less the present day, just a little 20 years ago. Um, and what's really interesting on here is, you know, there's major agricultural shifts and so forth, but the bubonic plague makes a very significant dent right there, just before populations expand with the Industrial Revolution. In 1350, it swept, well, around 1350, it swept through Europe. It killed 60% of Europe's population over a few years. It was 50 million people, 60% though. Now, 50 million people more or less also died from the 1918 flu. You can't see that because it's a bit of a blip because the population size overall was just much, much bigger. But that's not 50 million cases, it's 50 million deaths, right? That's a very significant impact on human populations, which is why we care about it, of course. So let me start the sort of discussion of how we model diseases by looking at one that we know pretty well. Okay, it's not too contentious about how to model it. Um, it's well understood. And then we'll shift into ones that are newer where we don't know what's going on so well and how we deal with that. Measles is a acute ugh, immunosuppressive viral illness. It looks like that if you get it. A lot of people don't get it anymore because we vaccinate. It causes fever, coughs, and all sorts of unpleasant things. And what um, is quite scary is that before there were vaccines, it would kill 2.6 million children annually. Okay. Um, in the 60s, a vaccine was developed, and it's a really good vaccine, and it's never struggled with sort of evolutionary problems. Um, so it became widely available in the 1980s. But even though it is widely available, uh, still 100,000 kids die a year of measles because they can't get at the vaccines um, and it's particularly bad in children under five. So this is a video of measles in the UK um, but it's only England um, and Wales so the top off bit is not that Scotland isn't there it's just that they don't record the same data and what you're seeing is those circles are bigger or smaller if there's an outbreak or not. So here look at London it's getting bigger and that's when you see these peaks and then in between there's sort of a dip and it kind of fades out a bit and then it comes back in a two-year cycle and this is what happened for a very long time before vaccines were in place um, and then in a second I'm going to sort of skip through um, quite quickly here we go we'll just skip through to a little bit later once the vaccine era is in place and what you can see now is look at the dynamics those peaks and troughs and peaks and troughs have faded out because we've added it. But you can still see it sort of shimmering around in England and in Wales here and up to Manchester. Okay? So it's not that it's, it's gone, it's just it's very well controlled by the vaccine. So how do we model it? Well, think about that, you know, a population that doesn't have the disease. And so everyone is what's called susceptible. They could get it, but they don't have it, they haven't had it. So we think about all of individuals being in a class together, a group together called susceptibles. And if someone comes in with the disease and bumps into some of those susceptible individuals, the disease can get passed on and people become infected at some rate, depending on how much you run into people who are sick and how catching the disease is, you know. So there's um, diseases that you know, it doesn't take very much for one person to infect, you know, up to 18 people. So measles is actually at that end. Whereas other diseases, it's a bit harder to pass it on. And then if you're lucky, you recover, okay? Um, after some period of time and you've been sick and you recover. 
OK, so we want to, you can write a model like that, and it's kind of along the lines of what I did on the board for the census. I'm not going to write all the equations because we get a little more into calculus because we're thinking about rates at which these happen, but it's exactly the same sort of bookkeeping. But the lovely thing about that is it's a model that describes the system, but then we can also start thinking about how can we use it to make it better. And what would you want to do? Well, it would be quite nice to take all those poor people that are over in the susceptible side here and dump as many of them over here as possible without actually making them go through the infected bit in the middle. And the way we do that is we vaccinate. Okay? So in the models, you can add in different types of management strategies, different ways of intervening in a system, and make it hopefully do what you want it to do. And you can use the model to explore those ideas. And that's why you can test things out just like we test a spaceship before we put it into space. Right? We can test out in the model, does it look like it would work? How well would it have to work? And so forth and so on. So let's have a look at what that would look like. This is a beautiful simulation from The Guardian, a British paper. And what we have here is 10 populations of individuals which are represented by little dots. And um, if they are yellow dots, they're susceptible. And if they are um, sort of pale blue, I guess it looks on this screen. Do you see? It's vaccinated. The key's at the top. So here you've got a 10% vaccination rate. By here, you're up at 68% vaccine up here nearly everyone's vaccinated and notice that there are some of these yellow dots with a little um, gray circle around that that's the people who've been vaccinated probably done what they should do but sometimes it just doesn't work it doesn't zero convert so that would be me i got measles despite being vaccinated sucks i can tell you um, and what we're going to do now is say a sick person comes in so let me push this imagine a sick person comes in and there you go, where there's very little vaccination, one person gets in and passes it on to everyone else. This is, this is actually set up for measles parameters. All right? But notice how you have to try a bit harder. There's more people bouncing in as you go through this sequence before it hits. Okay? So we're up at 83.8% vaccinated. Oh, it just hit finally. Oh, nobody that was not vaccinated, nobody susceptible was hit in that simulation. Okay, so what you can see is that some people will always escape, right? There's not everybody that is infected every time, even if there's hardly any vaccination. Some of those susceptible people just still didn't get sick, okay? We saw that it took much less time for it to take off in, in populations where there were fewer um, vaccine people. And the more people are vaccinated around you, it provides what's called herd immunity, because if everyone around you is safe, then you're safer too. So it's kind of a group effort to make everyone feel or be safe. And it's particularly important for people that are, say, immunocompromised that can't get a vaccine, right? That the people around them should be vaccinated, which is why we have um, requirements for sometimes in school districts and so forth. Um, so this just gives you a little idea of how that works. And so what we've done is, I haven't shown you the models that underlie all these, or the data that underlie all these, but what we've done is we've been able to use these models to explain the dynamics we saw in the past, which are these huge cycles with very big outbreaks every other year. And then when you start to manage it, we also can see what happens to the dynamics, which is that the world becomes a better place, fewer children get sick, fewer people die, um, which is obviously a good thing. Um, and that we've used the models, as I showed you, by adding things like vaccination into the models to understand how to manage it so we can describe what the system's doing and how it might behave in different circumstances, okay? So managing for some objective, not to have people sick or not to have people die, is incredibly important. So I wanted to think about that a bit more because it turns out you have to be very careful about it. We do really need clearly stated objectives. So I might tell you, I want to control coronavirus, or I want to control spotted lanternfly, right? But it turns out that if you just say, I want to control something, you might not mean the same thing as someone else who wants to control it. So um, let's start with spotted lanternfly. I'm sure you've all heard it's in the southeast part of this state. Okay, every time there's a football weekend, I don't know if you guys are all football fans, but 
Everyone's requested very carefully to check their vehicles and RVs and so forth, make sure spotted land and fly isn't on it. And if you have seen pictures, I should have found one for you guys, I'm sorry, but go online and look for pictures of spotted land and flies covering someone's house and just, just realize how much you really don't want that to happen here, because it's really unpleasant. So we might care about reducing its spread across Pennsylvania or stopping it jumping into new places, like really invading in a place where it wasn't before, like State College. Or we might just want to stop the outbreak or get rid of them, low, you know, oh, it got into State College, let's smash it down and get rid of it as quickly as possible, so that would be local elimination. Or we might try to really eradicate it, though that's going to be increasingly hard. You can make the same sequence of discussion for coronavirus, right? We don't want it to spread across the whole of China, nor do we want it to invade into Europe or the USA or into Africa. We want to stop the outbreak as quickly as possible, get rid of it where it is, and maybe eventually get rid of it completely, though that, I think, will be a bit of a long shot, but we'll see. Um, the problem is, this all sounds like, well, we're still just trying to do the same thing. But what we've been looking at is something that was triggered in the past for me by looking at a weed system, and I'll show you how it ports across into the disease system. So I was asked to work on some weeds in Australia, um, and one that I hadn't worked on before because everyone was arguing about what to do about this weed. It's, it's in and half these people want to do this and half the people want to do that and they're all fighting about it. Can you come in and model it and tell them what to do? And it turns out I wasn't very useful. Well, I was very useful. I never had to model it because I went in and it turned out people on the east coast of Australia were worried about it because it was in already and they wanted to get rid of it. So they were trying to think about how do I spray it or get rid of it by pulling the weeds or having things eat it. Whereas people on the West Coast were worried because it wasn't there yet. So what they wanted to do was stop it moving. So all these people were arguing about, do, do we do like movement bans or do we do anything that stops that? Or do we do stuff that affects abundance? And they're not the same thing. And they were arguing because they had different aims. And as soon as they realized that, it was possible to come up with a strategy that allowed for both components, right? So I did myself out of a bit of a job, but it was fine, it was a good cause. But the point was, if you aren't specific about your objectives, you can actually pull quite hard in the wrong direction. So you need to know what you're trying to do. So I saw this again in the Ebola outbreak. The objective to control spread may actually conflict with the objective to minimize mortality. What happened was we put a movement ban Lots of airlines shut down, didn't fly people from West Africa across um, to Europe or to the USA. But what happens if the flight isn't going out that way? It's also not going back with medical personnel, medical equipment and medical supplies. So that means that charities or people that, help, that want to help have to, can't just send stuff when they've got it or people when they've got it, they have to charter a plane and get it all together and coordinate much more and it del adds delays to the system and it makes it harder to deal with the problem in the source. And nobody's deliberately trying to make trouble, it's just it's not well um, clarified in much of the literature just quite how important it is to know what you're trying to do because if you don't know what you're trying to do, how do you know that you did it, right? Okay, so let's look at that then for measles, because we're still on measles. Um, and these are, um, this is how measles um, has been managed through time. It's managed under a UN Millennium uh, Goal, um, and the goal is Goal 4, which is to reduce childhood mortality, right? So the aim is not to have kids die. But if you look at all the different statements underneath that come from official documents, sometimes they're talking about increased coverage of vaccines, so they want the number of vaccinations to go up. Sometimes they want fewer cases, not fewer deaths, but fewer cases. Then we've got mortality again, and now the revised Millennium Goals talk about eradicating it. Now, at first glance, that's fine. If you have zero cases, then you will have zero deaths from measles, right? That makes sense, right? But on the way there, there's actually something that goes on that's quite interesting, and this is work that I did in collaboration with Matt Ferrari and my graduate student, Amalia McKee, who um, has now graduated from Penn State, but she led this work. And what she showed was that some of these goals are not the same or not pulling in the same direction, and I'll just give you a simple example of how that works. You could have a big outbreak of measles that happens in elementary and middle school and nearly nobody dies. So you have a lot of cases, but nearly no deaths. Or you have a small outbreak in the baby room of a daycare. You might have a tiny outbreak, 
but lots of those kids might die because of the um, age-specific mortality. Little babies, you saw the pictures earlier, they can't deal with this disease nearly as well. So the idea that zero cases and zero deaths are congruent is true, but on the way there, those are not necessarily pulling in the same directions, and it really matters. So all of these goals that I just showed you on the previous slide, I'll just put them up again, are incredibly important, but so is prioritizing them so that you really do work smarter, not harder, um, as you move through this process. Okay, so I talked about measles, which is a system we know pretty well, and even there, there are some things that still need to be smoothed out, clearly, to do the best job possible. And generally, there's one model per system that you might care about. When you do weeds, you're lucky if you get any models, actually. You know, people will just go and test things by spraying them and, and, and trying some different things. So you don't even sometimes get models at all. Um, and that's um, a, something I had never come across before till I moved into the disease realm was the idea that you really could have multiple models. Clearly, you see that in climate change and weather predictions, too. Um, and it generally happens when an issue is really important. So weeds, you know, the person who works on it gets very excited about them, but the rest of the world perhaps is not so excited. But with something like coronavirus or Ebola or hurricanes, clearly you really, really care, and lots of people step up to help. And this is what it will look like, say, for a hurricane. These are all model trajectory predictions starting from this initial point, the detail of the hurricane is not important, but there's lots of lines here. All of these are different models that predict where that hurricane's going to go. I'm particularly fond of this little purple one that decided it was going to go across Cuba. Everybody else thinks it's going up here. All right. And so those models, you can take the outputs and take some sort of average. And you see those pictures in the news when a hurricane's coming. Where is it likely to go? Where's the epicenter? Is it going to hit South Carolina or North Carolina? You know, and you get those trajectories. They use these models to develop that. OK? Um, the other place where this really happens a lot is for infectious disease. So anytime people are worried, clearly people jump in to try to help. And things like influenza, Ebola, Zika, and the current coronavirus outbreak, multiple models are being developed for these. And there's two reasons. One is they're really important, right? People are going to die from some of these things, and we really don't want that to happen. We're trying to make the world a better place. What can we do about it? But the other thing is, these are not as well studied as measles in many of the cases because they're new, and we just don't know what's going on. So one group could work on this and take the, all the information they can find and do their absolute best to write a good model, and they might disagree with another group that does the exact same process just because they know different stuff, they've worked on different things in the past, their theoretical constructs are different and so forth. And it's legitimate scientific disagreement, right? It may truly be like that. So if you've been watching coronavirus, a very big source of uncertainty is are there or are there not asymptomatic carriers? And at one point there were, then there weren't, then there were. Now there's some understanding there probably are some people who barely look sick and still can pass it on, right? Um, which is more worrying than if that wasn't true. But the uncertainty is we don't know how many, how often does that happen? Is there some other way we can detect it? These sorts of uncertainties come up all the time. Here's a really classic one that I'm very fond of, cholera in London in the 1850s. Um, at the time that this outbreak happened in Soho, the current wisdom was that cholera was spread by a miasma in the air, right? And this is not uncommon because malaria, which we know is uh, passed on by insects, mosquitoes biting you, is from the Ital Italian malaria, bad air. So it was also believed to, and it was because you'd go down into swampy areas and you'd come back and get sick. And so they thought it was the bad air in the swamps when in fact it was the mosquitoes, right? That's a very potted history of it. But the point is, the understanding about how these processes work wasn't very clear. Um, so John Snow, who is this amazing person here, um, watched this outbreak. He had already got suspicions that it had more to do with water than the air. So cholera, just for those who don't know, is passed out through water. It's uh, contaminated, so water contaminated with sewage, basically. And he mapped it out, and he didn't use these red dots. Someone put these red dots on where he put little black dots, but you can see it a bit better. And he also looked at all the pumps. So here's a pump, here's a pump, here's a pump on Broad Street, here's a pump, here's a pump. 
And he mapped out the extent of this. And then he got very worried because here's a workhouse, which is like an old poorhouse um, slash prison, um, which had 500 or more people in it, but had nearly no outbreak. And he was a bit worried, like, how would that be possible? And he went to see it, and it turned out they had their own pump, their own private pump. And then the other one I'm quite fond of is this. You can't read it. It's a brewery. And the people who worked there tended to drink beer instead of water. And so they also weren't getting as sick. So as soon as he did this, he worked out, well, the pump that's in the middle is here. And he very famously went. It's one of those old pumps where you have a handle. And he struck the handle off the pump. And he stopped the outbreak. All right? So this is a huge historical leap in infectious disease management. And the point was it was constrained by our, by our lack of understanding of the biological processes. And once that was worked out, then effective management comes into place. But until that time, all the uncertainty was impeding management. This also happened with Ebola. Um, this is an image by a New York Times photographer. And the only reason... I can bear to show it to you is because he actually followed up this boy's alive, he's been taken to hospital and he survived. Otherwise I wouldn't even show you this photo. But this was one of the photos that sort of galvanized me into thinking about, oh my goodness, there are all these models which I'll explain about. Um, this huge outbreak happened. At the time we were doing the work, there were already 55 models for this. And what was really a problem was they were majorly disagreeing about how bad the outbreak was going to be. Were you going to get 10,000 people sick or were you going to get up to one and a half million, right? And that's quite a big problem because you can't do resource planning if you don't know whether you're going to have 10,000 or one, you know, an order of magnitude more. And so one, we wanted to ask, well, what about the management? What should you do given this uncertainty about what's going to happen? And here's my sort of schematic of this, and I'll just walk you through this. Here are, say, three models, not 100, just because it would look really messy if I put 100 first. So imagine there's three models, and they're looking at different interventions, like putting people in hospital, or doing safe burials, or vaccinating, or something like that. Imagine you've got your policymaker, you don't like maths particularly, people are telling you this different stuff. And some two models are saying, do action one and one model saying something else. And it's very hard then to make a decision. But actually what you're seeing here is every single model has agreed that action three is rubbish, right? And actually you can get situations where some actions make things worse, like you put a lot of effort in and it actually makes it worse. So that happens not often, but in models you can see that. So you have actually learned something by taking the group of models and looking across that, and you could decide, well, I might go with vote counting, two out of three think this is better, or I might go with this one, say that one had, this actually happened in one outbreak that I've seen, where there was a model that had a good, um, um, had done a good job on a prior outbreak, so even though it disagreed, it got quite a lot of attention because it had done a good job before. So these things are hard, but it's challenging for, model, for, for a policymaker. So what we did was we got involved and we took as many of the models as we could, that were already out there. So we're not epidemiologists. We took the epidemiologist's presentation of the model in good faith and said, let's put that model in and recode it. And when I say we, I mean my former postdoc, Dr. Sholi Lee, who now is a professor in China. And officially, she's working on grassland and climate change in the Tibetan plateau. But we just put a grant in to the Chinese NSF to work on coronavirus using some of the methods I'll describe to you today. Um, so what she did was she took some of these basic models, and this is really like the measles model I showed you earlier, except it's got this exposed stage, because it turns out with Ebola you can have it, be walking around without symptoms, also not infecting anyone, but it sort of adds a time delay into the process, so you can add that in. But otherwise it's just like the measles model I showed you earlier, susceptible, exposed is the new thing, infected, and then unfortunately we call this removed, because people recover or die, so they're removed from the system. Um, and then it turned out some of the models had hospitals or looked at funeral practices, because funeral practices that um, generally involved um, washing the body. And of course, as it's passed on in fluids, that was making it very, very likely that as you um, prepared your parent for burial, for example, that you would pick it up yourself. Um, and people in Europe used to have these burial practices too. So um, um, nowadays, you know, we might go to a, a mortuary. Um, so this is what the full set of models kind of roughly looks like, where it's got 
um, hospital stages and funeral stages too. And most of the models that we looked at had some components of this. And I've drawn this little simple picture, but actually what it looked like was this but it's much less pleasant. So we'll just pretend it looks like that for purposes of today. But I'll zip through this. And what she did, what Sho Lee did then, was she, Dr. Lee, put in um, and asked the question, how big is it going to be? How many cases? How many people are going to get sick? And each of these bars is a different model, and it's structured, the first set in white, has no hospital or funeral, but you add these in. And what you can see very easily in the first set, but it's a true across them, is this imagines one sick Ebola patient gets into a population of 10,000 people. And you can see that it, it one model projects nearly everybody gets sick, all the way down to this model that says nearly nobody gets sick. So we recoded all those models and we got exactly what they said in the papers. Nearly nobody, 10,000 people, up to one and a half million. This huge spectrum. Um, and then what we did was we said, no offence, but I don't think that's the right question. I think the correct question is, what can we do to make the number of cases as small as possible? We don't care how many people you think will be sick. We just want to make sure that as few of them are sick as possible. And so we asked about some different management actions. And what happens when you do that? We, we asked about five main management actions. So being careful at funeral transmissions. I'm sure you saw videos of people coming, getting bodies, wrapping them up in plastic, everyone wearing personal protective equipment like that, the two people holding the poor boy in that New York Times article uh, photograph. Um, they would reduce um, transmission in the community, wash your hands, make sure you cover your mouth when you cough and so forth. They looked at trying to make it so that if you got sick, you'd, you had a better chance of recovering or you would be more careful in hospitals or get people to hospitals. And then the models are used to rank those, which is the best thing to do. And red is best and worst is down in pale. And you can see this again very clearly in this bit here for these very simple models even though they disagree hugely about how many are sick, you can see they all rank these as the best. Do you see that? So even though they're disagreeing about one question, they're completely agreeing about a different question that, in my opinion, is more important. Now, I want to be careful. Hospitalisation, getting people into hospital, is absolutely brilliant for the person who's sick, right? But it's not going to make the number of cases smaller in the outbreak overall. Okay, so it also depends on the question you're asking. Do you remember with the dog, I was saying, what's the purpose, right? If you ask one question, then you may get a different answer than if you ask another one. So despite the huge disagreement about projected cases, there's very little disagreement about management. Unlike the measles, there was very little effect of um, uh, the objective specifically. Um, so if you were trying to reduce caseload or mortality, it was about the same thing you would do. And the reason is, if you get it, you more or less have the same chance of dying. In measles, if you get it, it matters if you're a baby or not. So because some people are more or less likely to die, um, you actually have to ask those as separate questions rather than them being a bit more in agreement. The one I didn't mention, though, is we did ask the question, what do we do if we want it just to be over as quick as possible? And we had a huge panic because we put it in and the optimal action was to do nothing. And we went, oh my God, no, that must be a horrible mistake. And we checked all our code and we thought of all the ways to check it. And then we had a really close look and it turns out, no, really, do nothing. Because what happens is a ton of people die very, very quickly and it burns itself out, right? <laughs> and it's over super quickly, but it's at some serious expense. And it really illustrates that idea about how you are saying what you want to do can really make a, you can make a mistake, quite frankly. Um, so we didn't put that in the paper, but I do mention it here. <laughs> yeah, so it's very, very horrible. I mean, really sent us into a panic, and it's a horrible thought. So this then raises us, cause brings us to this really important question of which uncertainty matters? Um, because we don't have time when a new outbreak is happening to study everything. Okay, and so what we're going to do, think, think through now, is using all those models to focus on the things that really matter, as opposed to thinking about some of the stuff that you might work quite hard on and it turns out it doesn't matter. Um, and again, it's kind of coming back to this theme of my talk, which is that we want to use these things and our theory and our models to work smarter, not harder, because we could do an awful lot of work finding out stuff that it turns out isn't going to make any difference to what we do or what we understand. So we want to focus on uncertainty 
that makes us do something different, that changes our decision about how we manage Ebola or another disease. And I'm going to give you an example of a job offer, just because sometimes people have trouble thinking of it. Say you get a lovely job offer in a different city with a substantial pay raise. Yay! And they want to t you to decide by tomorrow. OK? So you've got one evening to work out what on earth are you going to do. All right, if I said you've got time to have a look at what the cost of living in that new city is, or you've got time to look at what the music scene is like. Which one, who would do the cost of living? <laughs> Unless you're a professional music, go, oh, go on. Who would do music? All right, oh, nobody. Every now and again, we get, you know, I get someone who it's obsessed about music and they will say that's more important all right and then so there's just, there's just, there's information that will help you make a better decision and information that be nice to know but it's okay i can survive without knowing it by tomorrow and then if you've got kids there's also a context dependent thing if you've got no kids it doesn't really matter you can stop there if you've got kids you really need to know about the quality of the school district in the new location so there is some information that you need to know to make a good decision but it depends on your context it's not entirely uh, relevant to some people, or if at all, it's very relevant to others. So um, I'm trying to illustrate that some information that matters more than other information, but also that some information only matters if you've got specific situation or questions. I am not the first person to talk about uncertainty. <laughs> Who remembers this guy? I can't resist. There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. So he got a lot of stick for that. So I'm not the first person to say it. It's actually not a bad description. He got a... Do you remember that? Do you guys remember that in the news? Oh, it was hilarious. Anyway. Who puts Donald Rumsfeld in a talk, I ask you? <laughs> you can't, how can you resist, right? It's too cool. So we don't have time to study everything, but we really do need to focus on the things that are mission critical. So there are things we know, to paraphrase him, we know about measles. There are things we know we don't know. We've got um, a disease like flu that's going around, but we maybe don't know which strain is going to be coming up this year. But it's, we know we don't know which strain is coming up, so we can plan for it. And then... A month and a half ago, out of the blue, came coronavirus. Now, some of us who work in infectious disease might go, well, actually, that happens periodically. We could have seen that one coming. But you don't really know it's coming. And I will tell you, MERS caught me by surprise, because there's lots of stuff that goes with bats and ro you know, rodents and things like that. Who was looking at camels? Really? Like camel? Anyway, I think that's a... You know, you don't know where these things are coming from. Um, so there's a lot of different things that you truly don't know. And you have to plan in different ways for dealing with these things. So we're focusing, as I said, sorry, on things that we don't know. And these really matter. So in the moment, we have coronavirus issues about asymptomatic carriers. And these are very famous. This is a a uh, funny old newspaper cutting about typhoid Mary. Um, she was an asymptomatic carrier of typhoid. And she worked as a chef, a cook. And it's a fecal oral transmission, so it doesn't say much for her hygiene. But she was personally never sick. She just shed it. And so she worked in multiple households. She made 50 people sick, several of whom died. Right, and they finally worked out where these outbreaks were coming from. It was all because she cooked in these households. They could trace them back to her. So they tried very hard to get her to stop. And they just said, we're not going to hassle you, but just stop being a cook. And she kept going back and cooking again in new families and infecting them again. So in the end, they quarantined her to an island off New York City. Um, and she died. And it was kind of sad she died there. I'm not sure how that would work now. But this is the story because these unknowns can't explain where these outbreaks are coming from. And unless you can pin it down, it's really, really hard to know where is it coming from, what can we do about it. So asymptomatic carriers, is, she's an example, and she's also a super spreader. She infected a ton of different people, in part because she was asymptomatic. So if you're missing this information, you can't project the dynamics, and it also makes it really hard to manage it, because you don't know what's going on, just like the cholera one that I showed you earlier. And this is an issue, as I said, with coronavirus right now. So for those of you who are worried about coronavirus, the best place to go for outbreak um, information is this um, really lovely dashboard by Johns Hopkins that I'll just show you quickly. 
WHO has reports, obviously you see stuff in the news, but this updates very regularly. They get information from the WHO, the CDC and various other um, health agencies. You can see the total deaths. We've just topped 67,000 cases that are recorded. They show these, these trajectories. Um, and you can go through and look at them by location and so forth. And so there are other places to look, but this is one of the most interesting places to actually have a, a summary of the information. Um, so what I've tried to te sort of talk through today is this idea that there are uncertainties, especially with new outbreaks, but even with, with older systems that we don't know as well, and that we really need to know what we're trying to do. So I've got this little cartoon here um, where we've got two models, right? Just as simple as possible. You've got two models that are affecting the system and there are two possible interventions. So let's pretend it's something like a new disease that may or may not have asymptomatic carriers, all right? Um, and maybe intervention A is take temperature when people are traveling and intervention B is quarantine them, right? Now, Quarantining them is much more expensive and it infringes on civil liberties in some way that poses ethical dilemmas, but it's going to work whether if model one says no asymptomatic carriers and model two says yes, there are asymptomatic carriers, it's going to work for both of them. Whereas um, if you take action A, it'll, if there's no asymptomatic carriers and you take people's temperature, that's probably going to catch everybody, but action B is going to miss the asymptomatic carriers. So if you want to learn about whether the system, if you were like watching it and you wanted to learn which, which one is true, you would do action A because if it works, you know that there are no asymptomatic carriers and if it doesn't work, you know that they are. I'm making this as like a cartoon, right? I'm just going to get the idea across. It's not that you'd actually do this, right? But if you just want it to work, why wouldn't you do action B? Right? So if you're just trying to make sure that the, somehow um, it's, uh, the process is slowed down, you can put this into a holding pattern. You can still learn on the side, but you might try to do something that's safe and robust to your uncertainty, okay? because that allows you to spend some time um, learning on the side while you put the rest of it into a holding pattern. Okay? So these ideas are really important and they come back to my point about knowing what you're trying to achieve because if you don't know what you're trying to achieve, how do you know that you did it? And I know I'm repeating myself, but that is quite an important um, point about all this. So um, let me just check. Um, I think we're slightly out of time. So what I'm going to do is skip a last little example that, um, that um, was just making some of the same points again for a different livestock disease and just summarize what I've discussed today. I hope I've showed you how we use models to describe both the dynamics of an infectious disease, but also how you might manage it, and to think about um, embracing the uncertainty that you have, and not just going, oh, well, let's just reach a consensus and go with the most parsimonious model and do the best job we can, but actually embrace the fact that, no, there are things we don't know, and we maybe can do a better job by looking at that range of uncertainty and finding things that maybe are robust to the uncertainty. Right? So no matter which model it is, here's a thing that might make it be okay or to use it to highlight ways that you could learn. And so you really need to be clear about your question or objective, but really, really, it's amazing how much you can use these multiple models to not try and do just find one single best thing to do, or best description, but to use the uncertainty and actually um, acknowledge it in order to do a better job overall. So thank you so much for coming today, and I'd now be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Shea. Um, we have our Science Line Pride students in the back, so if you have a question that you've written down during her talk, please hold it up as high as you can so they can see it, and they will come bring it down to me to pose to Dr. Shea during this Q&A um, period. And so while those questions are coming down, um, I'd like to start us off with a question. Um, could you talk a little bit about how Penn State is prepared to help fight the spread of infectious disease? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, in fact, we have a Center for Infectious Disease Dynamics, which is in the Millennium Science Building. So if you're walking back to the car park on your way out, there used to be a tennis court 20 years ago, if anyone remembers. Um, and now there's a huge building there. 
I can't remember how much it costs, but a lot. Um, we, we, have a, we have 30 core faculty from, let me get, 15 departments, five colleges that all work in the Center for Infectious Disease Dynamics. There's 30 core faculty and another, so up to 70 altogether that have, so for example, I'm not one of the core faculty. I also do other things. I don't work in Millennium Science, but I do disease work as I was telling you about today. So there's a huge group of people and they do modeling and they do sort of experimental work and field so there's people who are out in the field chasing wolves and looking at diseases like um, you know deer diseases chronic wasting disease Lyme disease um, uh, infectious diseases of all types um, people who who do lab work looking at viruses and different things so huge gamut of stuff going on and I will say when I came here in 2001 as a baby professor that none of that existed and it all started because a couple of faculty, Pete Hudson and Otto Bjornstad and others who were interested would have lunch once a week to talk about infectious disease stuff. And then they built up a seminar series and they got graduate students and they got more faculty involved. And Penn State is great at investing in efforts like this. And as I said, now we have this huge center for infectious disease dynamics. And they're very, very focused on addressing both global problems like this, but also issues that are really pertinent to Pennsylvanians. So farming issues, diseases that affect our local industries and so forth. So it's an amazing thing. And it really highlights how Penn State can take and invest in an area that's clearly important and build up something that now is, I mean, it's, it's certainly the most prolific infectious, you know, I'd say one of two most prolific pro infectious disease groups in the entire country, right? It's absolutely state of the art program here um, for infectious disease dynamics. Right. Does that, I guess that kind of answers that question. Yeah, well, thank okay. you so much. Um, and so there was one audience member who wanted to follow up on the unknown unknowns portion of what you mentioned, um, specifically about coronavirus, but I think the question could also apply to the study of any disease. Mm -hmm. um, so what, um, it, it maybe in the example of coronavirus, what could be, what are some examples of those unknown unknowns? And if those exist, how would you... <laughs> How would, you, how would you figure out like, how, to, how to identify those things that, yeah. that you don't know? And is it, do you have to kind of just use your curiosity and, and pick a few things, or is there a way that you can try to identify those? Yeah, so there's two parts to it. I'm, I always do stuff on the side, but you know, it's, you know, so I always have little side projects where I'm thinking something might be a problem, but I don't have money for it, you know, because who was funding coronavirus six weeks ago, right? It didn't even exist, right? Um, so we're looking... Always, people are always looking for these sort of generalities. But it's, I had a conversation with an epidemiologist recently, and we were talking about these ideas about what you know you don't know. And, and his, his point was, well, you know, a new outbreak of a novel disease is an unknown unknown. And I said, well, not really, because I expect that will happen again. We had Ebola not that long ago, SARS, MERS, avian influenza. Probably something else is going to happen. I expect within a decade we would easily have another thing like this crop up. I don't see why not, um, given that human populations, say, in West Africa are hugely encroaching on... Um, rainforest habitat, it forces these interactions between humans and other species where these jump opportunities are available. This is what probably, you know, Wuhan, it was a market, right? So who knows what the organism was, but I, I, it was a very loose definition of fish market, right? If it's got pangolins and civets and birds and, right? It's not really a fish market. It's bringing in all sorts of wildlife which are sold as pets sometimes, but mostly food products. So it's called the bushmeat trade. Um, and, you know, shutting down a market may just force that underground, right? And then it's harder to control. So one doesn't really know. Um, so I would have said it's not really an unknown unknown, but to someone else it would be. So I do think it's got something to do with your experience. But once in a while, something will happen that you just go, oh, I really didn't see that coming. And that's what I mean. And you do your best to plan for it. And the more you know, I guess, I, I guess my point is that I, you could have argued, if you didn't do epidemiology, that coronavirus was an unknown unknown, but I could have, you could have said it was going to happen, even, just not what was going to happen and where and from what it was going to come. Mm -hmm. Does that kind of help? Yeah. I think so, because the topic of unknown unknowns, I think, is just difficult in general, because yeah. you yeah. don't know. But, you know, you so a know. true unknown unknown would be like a space alien arrives and adds to this model by doing alien abductions, right? You know, 
I mean, you can pick it, you can, you can, how does that work? Okay. Oh, you like that one. Okay, so that, so there's an example. I'm just making this up, but my point is, you know, something totally out of the blue. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, I do, there are a few other questions that came in specifically about coronavirus, but I wanted to introduce this one because it builds off something you just talked about, was um, the, the suspicion or the likelihood that a new, out, a new outbreak will come, even though if we don't know exactly what it is. And so there's one audience member who's wondering if, if, models, can, if models exist that, can tr that try to predict what or where that new virus will appear and you know is it more likely to be in china since there's been you know new outbreaks more more there than other places or how how would that process well so look like? so i do think i do think so if i were and actually i am writing a paper on how we look for different types of outbreaks with um, a colleague who's a wildlife surveillance expert so he's looked at these like how do you look for weird stuff in wildlife and actually we had this again this big debate about it and you could do it and you could say where there's i if i was put on the spot i might say where there's the highest population growth closest to native forest or land with high densities of animals I might write the model that talked about where those coincide, and it would give me West Africa, China, and Asia, um, because we cleared out Europe and the US a long time ago, right? We already did this. We've, we've shut, chopped down all our European forests. Okay, I'm exaggerating a bit, but you know, we've, we've been through this stage. And um, you know, um, the bubonic plague, the one I showed you that killed 60% of the European population, that is supposedly originated in waves from Asia. Um, and there were big exchanges of diseases when uh, the Americas were colonized by Europeans. So um, smallpox went one way, syphilis went the other way. Things like that um, happen. So it's when things meet that haven't yet met, I think. So you could write a model that did that. I'm not sure how. I mean, it would be a little bit hand wavy. But you might say that those places are likely to be hotspots. But I don't really need to do any maths to talk through that. So that was more like a mental model, right, rather than a mathy one. OK, well, thank you so much for taking a stab at that. Um, I'm going to try and group our coronavirus-specific questions together. <laughs> but if, if somebody has another one that comes up, you can always feel free to ask it. Um, I think the, the questions are kind of ranging between two different main questions, which is, first of all, about the coronavirus models. Um, if you could speak at all to how, how good they are and maybe how they could be improved and maybe how long it takes in general before it actually becomes a, a good model. Hmm. And an audience member um, has seen some kind of projection about um, 70 to 80 percent of people getting the coronavirus. Maybe that's one projection that's out there. Hmm. So if you could speak in general to the models that exist for coronavirus now and the likelihood of them improving and what that might take. So, I mean, Seriously, it started on December 30th before anyone even heard about it. So there's a lot of uncertainty. But what people are doing, can you still hear me? Yeah. What people are doing um, is, is it's, an inf it's, it's a sort of pneumonia-ish, flu-y-like thing. So they're starting with models from that. They're using theory that exists. They're adding things. I've seen lots of these models. They're all over the place, all flying around amongst the community. Um, they've got some exposed stages. They've, you know, so the, the exposed but not infectious. They've got asymptomatic classes. They're looking at a bunch of different um, quarantine and hospitalization stuff. It's all over the map at the moment. Um, because there is such a lot of uncertainty. The US CDC is coordinating significant efforts. So I'm um, on group calls that are looking at projections for the US, and I'm on group calls that are looking at interventions. I personally think they should be the same group calls, but they're not, they're separated. So there's sort of resource planning, and then what do we do about it? And the projections are, I mean, you've seen this in the press. I'm not leaking, you know, secrets or anything. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. There's no secrets to leak. But, um, you know, it, it could just fade out. It's possible. But it also could take off and become what we call endemic, where it's just like flu and it circulates around like other coronaviruses. And the, the projections are all over the map. Um, and the example that I skipped because we slightly ran out of time was doing that for a live, modeling that for a livestock disease. Um, what we had was, I should just show you the picture very quickly because it's easier. Oh, well, no, I shouldn't if I'm going to be an idiot about it. But um, um, what we did with a postdoc for a livestock disease was um, 
we looked at the end of an outbreak of foot and mouth disease, which is of cow, cows and sheep and things. And uh, the postdoc, Dr. Probert, who's now at Oxford, um, he said, we looked at a Japanese outbreak of this disease and um, a British outbreak of this disease. And we said, at the end of it, we know everything about it, right? What was the best thing to do? How big did it get? And then we said, let's pretend we're in week one and we only have week one's data. How big do we think it's going to get? And what do we think we should do? Now pretend we have two weeks of data, three weeks of data, four weeks of data. And we kept adding a week at a time. And then we said, how quickly do we know how big it's going to get? And how quickly do we know what to do about it? And it turned out it took absolutely ages to know how big it was going to get. All right? But again, just like that Ebola one, very quickly we knew what to do to make it as small as possible. So it's possible that the action part might clarify quicker. And we kind of are doing a lot of things already that are intended to curtail it, right? But we're just going to explore other options. But predicting how big it's going to get turns out there's so many, like all it takes is one something that slips through and triggers, you know, I, I'm watching that coronavirus thing and um, there's nothing in Africa and I don't believe it. And I think it's more that there's, well, I'd be delighted but astonished if it's not there. There's only two labs in the whole continent of Africa that can diagnose coronavirus. And if it hits some mega city like Lagos, it's just going to go ballistic. But I don't know, you know, or it may just not get there. And, and so it could be one way or the other. And it just, I think it probably will blow up. I don't know. Um, but I really can't tell you because the projections are just too hard. And this is total speculation, guys, right? So you shouldn't take this as a scientist said. I'm not really an epidemiologist. This is just looking at what people have discussed and what I've seen in other systems. But in this case, for a, a livestock disease, that was true. And it was true in our models for Ebola. But that's two examples, and there are hundreds of diseases. So it could just be that they were two outliers, right? I, I don't want to draw anything general from those insights at this time. Is that fair enough? Yes, it is. Um, and then I, I know that you're more on the modeling side than the management side, but we did have a few questions about um, what you might know or be able to speak to about um, the latest of that's known or what is being recommended for management of coronavirus and mm. if, if anyone's using adaptive management. Ooh, good question. Adaptive management. Um, adaptive management is management with a plan for learning about the system, and I think we're pretty much forced into doing it on an ad hoc basis now. I haven't seen any formal efforts to invoke adaptive management where it's a deliberate plan to learn. Um, and with human diseases, there's also ethical constraints on that. So if you're doing that with a weed, you can just go, well, I think this won't work, but let's try and make sure. And you can learn a lot, but have it go really wrong for the weed problem. And you never want to do that with people, right? So um, um, it can be qu quite hard. Um, oh, tell me the first part again, because I got into the adaptive management part. Sorry. Oh, just if you know what the latest managed recommendations yeah. are. So, um, because people have seen outbreaks before, they kind of know what to do, right? So travel bans are a little bit of a mixed bag, as I told you, with the Ebola virus. If you put them in models, you can actually make it worse. I'm unclear what it's doing in this case, and I, I, I wouldn't like to speculate. But um, my colleague, Sho Li Li, the professor in China, she hasn't left her house for six weeks. And she's not anywhere near Wuhan. The university's closed down, the schools are closed down. Can you imagine sitting in your small apartment with your two little kids and your husband's been out twice to get rice and flour this is this is her take on this and you're trying to work but she sends me emails when I'm awake which means it's three in the morning with her because she's like this is the only time I can work um, because my kids are at home there's no way that and this is all self well so the universities have chosen to close but a lot of people are just self-isolating um, and it's sort of called group the group term is social distancing so there's no big events, no mass marriages, no concerts. People aren't generally going to work. And it's all, a lot of it is sort of suggested by the government, but a lot of it is just people self, it's self imposed. And I might do it too. I, I, you know, imagine if it came here, I might just take my kids out of school. I don't know, or I might not. I think about it, I take advice. But you know, you can see why people would do that. So there's lots of things that people are doing that are very sensible. But some of those things might not be necessary, and that's the bit that's a bit hard. It depends how risk-averse you are. Um, but 
I think that answers most of that question. Yeah, Sorry. Absolutely. Rambling now. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, so this question is a, kind of a general, general question about disease modeling. Um, and so is it, is it truly possible to eradicate a disease or does it lurk somewhere always? And I guess how is that reflected, if at all, in, in disease models? Yeah, so it has happened. There are, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's smallpox, which does exist um, oh, in vials in a couple of repositories around the world, but is, it's completely eradicated in, in nature, which is great because you saw that disgusting picture, right? You really don't want to have that. Um, and then rinderpest, um, which is a cattle disease in West Africa, and it's actually really hard to do it. So they're trying to do it for TB and polio is the really big push. Um, and there's a lot of problems with um, trying to do it in a war zone. So Afghanistan, Pakistan border, there's, and there's some lurking bits in Africa in these high conflict zones. And then, you know, there's yeah, so there's, there's stuff that happens that makes it really, really hard. And interestingly, I, I haven't seen this clip, but my sense from what I've done for weed stuff is that how you model it to get it down low is not, and how you manage it to get it down low is not what you do in the end game. So that there's like some different rules that apply when you get down to these last little firefighting bits. When you've just got a lot of it and you're just trying to squish it down, you can do a generic thing and then otherwise you're kind of playing whack-a-mole in a sense. Um, so that, it, that I'm not clear there are really good models for it, but there definitely are people working on those issues because it would be amazing. And I know that the Gates Foundation is incredibly enthusiastic about trying to eradicate something. All right, thank you so much. Um, All right. I have two questions that I'm going to try and combine into a general question about disease modeling. Because um, one question is about whether cost is ever included in, um, in the modeling about interventions and what might be more, uh, more effective. And then there was another observation from an audience member about um, apparently he, um, they, they, they've seen that there's been one case of coronavirus in Egypt as of today. Um, and that maybe Africa's hot and humid climate could be one reason that the spread is not happening there. So mm -hmm. would things like cost and the, the climate or the, you know, the temperature and the humidity of, yeah. of places, is that factored into the models? And you know, would yeah. that have to be many separate models or how could those be incorporated? Yeah. So actually surprisingly, costs are not often included except sort of by the economic side of people. And I'm really feeling that push because I've started collaborating with economists recently and they're like what do you mean no costs I'm like really if coronavirus got into the USA they'd just throw more money at it so I wasn't really worried about that when I first started thinking about these things um, but it should it is you know you get a benefit for a given cost and it might be that there are two things where one is slightly better than the other but if this one is way cheaper why wouldn't you do the slightly less good thing that you can do a ton of right so you really do want to weigh it in um, but it isn't done that often, and it's not weirdly done in insect and weed management either. So it ought to be done more. Um, and then um, using theory about these influenza-like and pneumonia-like diseases, there is a strong belief that it might fade out during the summer months when it's hotter, in which case that might explain that sub-Saharan Africa hasn't shown a great surge of cases. That's an extremely good point that I hadn't actually just thought through particularly, but it, it is possible. But the point is, we don't know this disease. And so until someone can do tests like that on it, then um, it's very hard to say. But people do do tests like that. You know, so for example, for things like dengue or what have you, mosquito-borne diseases, Penn State's doing work on how temperature affects things like transmission and so forth for those diseases. So it's perfectly possible to do it for other diseases. It's just, you know, we're, what is it, six weeks in to a completely new thing. So everyone is scrambling. And we don't have money for it, right? So I'm on these coronavirus group calls with the CDC, they're not paying anyone, we're all just doing it to help. But at some point, you can't have people doing lots of modeling without paying them salary. So at some point, money has to come in from somewhere. We're all just sort of retooling slightly or doing it on the side of everything that we're trying to do anyway. And it's not like we weren't busy beforehand, you know. And, um, um, you know, but this has happened before. Um, the NSF put out a rapid call uh, for funding for the Ebola virus, which is how I had my postdoc work with me. 
Um, but you know, a lot of what we're doing is trying to see how can we do it even faster than we were, um, you know, when an outbreak like this happens. Um, and it's not clear there's been calls for funding from different agencies like the Wellcome Foundation, which funds diseases. So we'll see if that kind of happens. Um, but otherwise, it can be quite challenging to, to, you know, if you've got other commitments, you have to work on them too, right? So it can be difficult for people to shift gears very rapidly, but clearly everyone wants to. So there's a lot of work happening without compensation at the moment, I would say. Yeah. All right. Thank uh, you. I think I maybe got off topic there too. I'm sorry, but I did. Your, your questions. answers will lead you where they lead you. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, and so this one is a very, very big picture question. I think that pits the, the kind of different objectives between disease management and maybe concerns about earth carrying capacity, the growing population, mm -hmm. because if we more effectively, you know, control disease, I think maybe that exacerbates the other side of the question, which potentially could be, you know, how, how can earth sustain the growing population? And so we have one audience member who's curious if you have any, you know, experience or um, um, thoughts on any challenges between balancing those two on a, on a very large scale and any solutions, even though it's a very big question. So yeah. um, potentially not any concrete solutions at this point. Yeah. So the earth is a limited resource. And if we use all our resources up, then I don't know, have you ever, I don't know if you ever did like intro bacteriology classes where they show here, we've got bacteria, they grow in a Petri dish and then they excrete and they poison themselves and they die out. I'm like, how is that not what we're doing in one very real sense, right? Okay. But it is possible. We've had the Green Revolution. We've had um, major shifts in technology that allow us to increase the carrying capacity of the planet. But it is at some expense to our native biodiversity and so forth. You know, some people would argue, well, we'll colonize other planets and it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, so there's a whole gamut of possibilities that can happen. I personally think we should consider ways of um, minimizing our growth rates. And, but, you know, China's one child policy didn't work well. I'm not even going to start on abortion in the US versus Europe because that's a completely different philosophy. Um, but any sort of um, slowing births potentially could be very beneficial because at the other end of the spectrum, you know, we haven't done much about this, but we've done lots about making sure this isn't as bad. People used to have 10, 20 kids because most of them would die in child, in infancy, right? You know, that's not that long ago that that was, that was the birth rate in Europe and the US too. So, um, so there's a lot of different factors that are going on and people model this all the time. There's a very famous professor um, at Columbia that I, I work with who looks at human population growth and the economics and the disease and tries to integrate it all. Um, so there are people who are addressing these questions and trying to work out what policies will allow us to sustainably live on this planet without causing these terrible disasters. Because the more people there are in close proximity, the more a disease like this can blow through it and cause a lot of damage as well. And I think it would be a lot, just a lot of unnecessary suffering um, but everyone has different opinions about it. And it, it's a great sort of topic for debate if you want to chat about it. It's, it's, there's lots of different ways you can think about solving these problems, um, but I don't work on that explicitly. So, All right, thank you so much. Um, this is the last question we have. If anybody has a last quick question, feel free to, to raise it up so our students can run it down. But and I see one more, and then there's one more back there. So um, uh, this, this question is kind of generally about um, disease management. Again, knowing you're on the modeling side, if you could speak to whatever you know about it. Um, this audience member posed a specific example of how people who lived in Europe during the mad cow disease are still not allowed to donate blood by the Red Cross. And so, you know, how extensive do these, you know, these control measures have to be? Are those kinds of things effective? And again, if, if anything, you know about the, the management of that. Yeah, I'm one of those people. Um, and I was vegetarian, right? So it's not like I even ate cows and they still won't let me give blood here. So that's right, I'm really squeamish, so it's probably a good thing because I used to freak out all the British nurses by crying the whole way through my blood donations. Like, I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> but they're like, please don't come back too often. You freak our nurses out. Anyway, um, so yeah, some of these, uh, this is one where I would say perhaps that's like overkill. Um, I certainly wouldn't be a risk to anyone. And you can do tests on blood to see, and plasma donations possible, but they won't, won't let me do that either. And um, 
you know, so I'm talking from personal experience only, but um, so there are some actions that, you know, can actually just be a little bit too much. Um, and we see that all the time, you know, someone has a weird accident and everyone gets worried about liability and then you're not allowed to do a thing that might lead to that weird accident ever, which then precludes you doing all sorts of other things that were actually sensible. And we see those examples all the time. Um, so it's just one of the things that happens. Um, but specific, yeah, so I would say there are actions that are immensely useful and we want to look for those and that there are these ones that interfere and we want to avoid them, but it's a little hard to get it right. The balance can be a bit hard to find. All right, thank you so much. Okay. Um, our last two questions, we have one that's specifically, I think, about one of the graphs that you'd, you'd pulled up earlier, and then mm -hmm. one that's more generally about disease modeling. Mm -hmm. And so the first question um, relates to um, the graphs you were showing about measles outbreaks, and one audience member is just curious why they would be occurring every other year as opposed to every year. Okay, so what happens, as this is... I'm not perfect at this, but what happens is um, kids are born um, and they get added to the susceptible population. So you have an outbreak, you get blow through everyone so that there's very few susceptible people left and the kids get born and the population builds up. So it changes if the birth rate is higher or lower. And once you've got enough of them, it usually triggers on the start of the school year because all the kids get together that have been separated over the summer and then one of them's sick and it blows through again and it takes a couple of years to build up and there's some lovely work by a woman that was a postdoc here um, Jess Metcalf who's now a professor at Princeton and um, she shows that the dynamics you get for measles in the US and this old UK system were different because the length of the summer holidays were different. So the build-up period, and it's such a cool piece of work. And you just go, oh, who thought about summer holidays driving when the outbreaks of diseases happen? So there's some quite, so that's kind of the uh, biology behind it. Yeah, and I did answer that question. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank Good. you. Yes. Case for more vacation, maybe. Um, and then this, this last question kind of builds off the other questions about things to potentially include in disease models. Um, one audience member is curious about whether a mut mutation or mutation rates of a pathogen could be included and how that might affect management decisions. Yeah, absolutely. So the flu people, I don't work on flu, but that's absolutely what's going on. There's lots of strains, new ones are evolving all the time, and they have to include that. I do not do evolutionary modeling at all, at all, at all. So I can't talk about it much more, but yes, if it's appropriate for a disease, then it's definitely included in the models and they become a little more complicated. So the very simplest way you could think about it is say there were two strains of a disease, you would have mirror, you know, mirror image models and if they could change one to the other, you would have that go on and so forth. And you can just build it into the models, you just have to know about it enough to include it or to hypothesize that it might be there and include it and see if it makes um, a sense of what you're actually seeing. So yes, it's absolutely imp uh, possible and it certainly is done where that sort of, um, there's evidence that those sorts of, of evolutionary dynamics are in play. All right, thank you. It goes to show how complicated the field is even within disease modeling, oh, evolutionary, yeah. oh, yeah, non-evolutionary. That's how we have, yeah, that's how we have that many faculty work. Because there's a lot of people working even just on modeling diseases here, even just at Penn State. But, you know, worldwide, there's a lot of different diseases. They all require different approaches and um, so forth. So there's a, there's a lot of diversity in these models. I just showed you the essence of some of the simplest ones. Hmm.